And uh, anybody, I know we have some high school students here. If you do go to Rutgers, if you do like what you see, and you do want to join the team, come along, knock on my door when you get to Rutgers. We'll see if we can put you to work too, okay? Put you to work too, see you Without further ado, Mark Crump, everyone. Well, welcome to Rutgers. Uh, welcome to the physics. I hope we'll, you'll learn a little physics and be more important have a little fun and go away thinking about how much fun it is. Okay, we'll start off. We usually do this just like we do for, our, for an undergraduate course, the order of, the, of things. And the first is matter in motion. And the very first of the laws of motion is that objects at rest tend to stay at rest. My wife is extremely familiar with this. It's me on the couch. <laughs> and here I have some objects. If I pull them slowly, friction acts on them. We won't go over that. But if I pull this out quickly, they should be objects at rest tending to stay at rest in their inertia. They should keep them out of my face. <laughs> Right here. Remember, there's an awful lot of force on us 
from our atmosphere. We don't really realize it because it's there all the time. But if you were to go to outer space or go to the top of a really high mountain, you would notice things are pretty different because the air is so much less pressure. But all that air pressure, when it actually comes through that side, is going to go ahead and re-enter that side of the tube. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The ping pong ball that's inside there will then be accelerated, the mass of it, down the tube. And when it leaves the side of the tube over here, that ping pong ball will be going 700 miles an hour. That's how much force of atmosphere is on us. It says a ping pong ball at 700 miles an hour. Well, what's inside here? Kansas, right? They're empty cans of soda, but cans of soda are, you know, that's a metal piece, right? This is just a light and fluffy piece of plastic. But let's see what a 700 mile an hour ping pong ball can do to all those cans. By the way, we do have some loud noises in our show, and this is one of them. If you're scared of loud noises, especially you here in front, you may want to cover your ears like this, okay? Three, two, one. Can anybody see the ball going through the tube? Which way it's headed. But do we really need the shell behind us for me to go forward? No. 
Yeah, I just want you to see how much force is coming out of this because it's going to push me forward and push her backwards, all right? Three, two, one. Is rotating and it's pinning. He's 
watch the cross player, he comes downfield and some burly guy comes up. He does it much faster to pin it in stronger so that when it gets hit, it, gets, it doesn't get knocked out. It's also a good way to introduce the concept of energy in motion. If I take this guy and I very gently throw him, I'm giving him what we saw called kinetic energy or energy of motion. So if I throw him very gently, that is a certain amount of oh Okay. That was a little bit of energy of motion. On the other hand, if I do a shot like motion, that was a great deal of energy of motion. Okay? You all know this because if you've ever played baseball and you stand there in the batter's box and you have a little weak pitch comes by, you don't feel nervous. On the other hand, if you've got somebody throwing a 100 mile an hour fa fa fastball, you have a real sense of energy of motion and worry worried about it, okay? So you all know about energy of motion. Now there's also energy of position. And the lacrosse stick is good for that. Because if you put a object in a certain position and drop it, it will gain a certain, it will, that is energy of position that converts to energy of motion at the bottom. Position energy to energy of motion. And if I hold it way up here, the energy of motion it gains will be much larger. Okay? Well, a pendulum is an object that transfers energy back and forth between energy of position and energy of motion. You got this one? Yeah, I bet you can use this one to start. Okay. Well, which one? Small. I'll do it for the rest of you. Yeah. Oh, I'll maybe go around. Come on in. Come on. That's okay. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I've got to fit up here in the net. Okay. I need energy of position. Okay. I'm not sure what's what we're getting, Mark, or the ladder. <laughs>
if I do do it, the, its natural way it likes to vibrate is like this. So if I jiggle it really fast, do bum, 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 I go bum, 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 nothing happens. It's not near its natural way it likes to vibrate. If I pull very slowly, bum, bum, it also doesn't have any response. But if I pull it at the same rate that it likes to vibrate, You can see the oscillations go from <laughs> to the point where the system pulls and throws itself apart, okay? This is resonance. You're feeding in the energy at just the right rate to make the thing vibrate. Now, what we have is this. What's, uh, what's this? Okay. Uh, uh, glass. And then, you know, kids, it's the holiday time, so what might happen is your parents might take you out to a really good restaurant during the holidays, right? You might go out with family or something like that. And when you sit down at the table, these glasses will be on front of, in front of you at the table. But the waiter or the waitress knows you're too young to have any wine, right? So what's the waiter or waitress going to do after a couple minutes? Take that glass away, just like this, right? Don't let that happen. Instead, <laughs> Take your hand, put it at the bottom of the wine glass as soon as you sit down. Just hold it tight against the table. Take your other fingers, put it right in your dad's water glass like that. <laughs> then go ahead and rub the top of the wine glass. And you get that beautiful tone coming from the wine glass. Your energy going into the wine glass giving you now sound energy. That's a pretty sound, right? But the best part of this experiment is, who will you be bothering? <laughs> everybody in the restaurant, including your parents. You say, hey, knock it off, you're bothering everybody. You say, hey, I'm doing physics, this is going to happen all night long. <laughs> who else is going to hear the sound? Is the waiter, right? The waiter comes up to you and says, hey, you can't do that in my restaurant. This is a quiet restaurant. Say, waiter, i got a question for you. If I take the rest of my dad's water and I fill the wine glass, is it a higher tone or a lower tone? You sound just like the waiter. What do we do to find out? Try it. That's how we really learn to look. We've got to try things. It's a lower tone now. It's a lower tone because you have the density of the water mixing with the density of the wine glass. You can actually see the little sound waves dancing in the top of the uh, water now, too. But even better, you'll be bothering your parents even. Go ahead and do that. Now inside here, you can see we have a beaker in this big box. And I can make this beaker ring the same way we just rang that, only I'm not going to do it by touching it, by rubbing the top. I can make it ring with sound. And that beaker is now ringing at its resonant frequency because I know exactly what the resonant frequency is, so I can ring it. You don't see anything happening in there, and you really shouldn't just trust me. You, shouldn't just, you should say, hey, Dave, I'm going to see some truth in it, right? So let's turn those lights out. And yeah, I know it's romantic now. And uh, what I'm going to do is turn this light off, but turn this light off. When I come out and put the sound back inside, you can see we're shaking the walls of that beaker quite violently. All that sound energy actually making the walls of the beaker move. But what if I give it too much sound energy? What might happen? Yeah. Would you like to see that? Yeah. All good news. Fantastic. Okay, good. Also, Anna, can you be pretty loud? 
Yeah. Excellent. Okay, good. Those two things. Uh, number three, and this is the most important of all. No matter what I do on the other side of that room right there, please don't let go. If you let go, I get hurt. No pressure like that. <laughs> I come way over here. So Anna's got one side of this long rope slinky. I have the other side of this long rope slinky. All right? Let's check in with Anna right away. Anna, do you feel a little force right now, a little pull? Yeah. Yes, she does. But, but hey, this is a rope slinky, right? It's a spring. You're pulling a spring, you feel a force. We know that. Hold on tight. Try not to move at all, OK? I'll do all the motion. All right? What kind of motion is this, everyone? Up and down. Up and down. Looks like a jump rope. But what do we call this in physics and in science? It's a, wave. it's a wave. It's a big wave, but this is wave motion. That's exactly what we have right here in front of us, a big wave. Let's check in with Anna. Anna, do you feel a little more force with the slinky motion? Yeah, it's true. But look at this. The slinky's not moving towards Anna or away. Anna still feels all the energy of this motion. And that's the truth and beauty of wave motion. In sound, in light, the energy travels in that wave. Not much else comes with it but that energy. That's just what we have right here in our long rope slinky. All right? Now, Anna, hold on tight. Try not to move at all, OK? Remember, I'll do all the motion. We're doing great. All right. We now have two waves where we used to have one. Let's check in with Anna again. Anna, is that a little harder to hold? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot more energy in this wave rope slinky right now. Hey, and you notice there's two waves instead of one? Well, it's true in sound. It's true in light. The smaller a wave, the more energy is in it. It's true in rope slinkies, too. You're right there in the center of our wave. That's the node of the wave. The part of the wave that doesn't really have to move at all, and all the energy still propagates through. A big round of applause again for Anna. Real, but they're not really real. 
That's what we have to deal with in life. Sometimes things really don't occur. Now, what we do in our lab all the time is we play. And one day I came into my uh, lab and I noticed, <laughs> I noticed that my students actually made this shape. Because they play all the time. And I said, wow, what are you doing with that? They said, we found out something. So I'm going to put this shape now on the front of the garden. Oh, oh, square, square, square. And uh, I'm going to put a, more, a little more theatrical fog in here. Because it turns out when you put an ellipse on the front of this, this is now a very modern physics cosmology demonstration. Does anybody here know what gravity waves are? Yeah, we've heard of the term. But this actually replicates exactly how gravity waves move through time and space. Because when I hit this now, you'll see an oscillating ellipse go through there. As it goes back and forth, back and forth, there's a quadruple motion to that ellipse, and that's exactly how gravity waves look in time and space. So this is now a modern physics demonstration. Think of the beauty of that using a garbage can. There you go. Uh, of a gravity wave propagating through space time, and you see it oscillates back and forth between a lips with long axis this way and a lips with long axis that way. And that's exactly what was going on with this part of the Oh, I should do the way, I should do the, I should do the way. Yeah, I should do the way through here. Okay. Uh, I have a simulation just to make sure you get this idea. Here is a wave that uh, you notice is I'm wiggling it very slowly. We call this a low frequency. Let's do it in terms of sound waves. This wave would be like a low frequency vibrating back and forth, very low in frequency. If I make it vibrate faster, okay, let's crank up the frequency. A wave! Notice that now it vibrates back and forth, and now it would be like a high frequency. Yes, it would be a very high frequency, so I can throw the bodies like this. And you notice the wavelength is short. The distance between the, distance between the beats is short. Okay. If I go back to low frequency, the distance between the peaks and the wave become very long. That is a long wavelength, low frequency. Short wavelength, high frequency, high energy. Now we are going to uh, one other thing. Uh, here I we're going to now do the standing wave on a rope, and here I have a wave that travels. So let's uh, there it's traveling along, and you notice it hits a wall, and so the red wave running wave reflects and gives us a blue traveling wave. And the important thing about a wave is it swings positive and negative. And when you do arithmetic, you add a plus number and a negative number, and they partially cancel each other, right? Same thing with a wave. You get the negative swings and the positive swings canceling each other out, and what you end up with, the sum of the two, is a standing wave, this one in black. And that's exactly what David's going to do here. He's going to vibrate this end and send waves down that way. They're going to reflect back, and the two different waves are going to give us standing waves on the string. And only the ones that exactly fit in precisely to the length of the thing of the rope are going to fit. And just to give you a picture of that, there'll be a series of standing waves, and that's what they're going to look like. So I can actually like just kind of just pull on this. You see there's a pulse going back and forth, pulling back and forth, just by pulling on it. Well, we have the world's oldest drill here. If I start to actually oscillate this drill, you'll notice. <laughs> we actually have now that fundamental standing wave that we see at the top of that picture. You see it's a there and we have a node on one side, we have a node over here on the other side, and it's rather large in the middle. I'm now going to increase the energy. Remember, the smaller wave, the more energy you have. So I give it more energy, well, it jumps to that next stage. Right to there. The market actually put his hands right in there, and all of that energy still gets through. Right? That's the node of the wave. Oh, you've already jumped to the triple. I just dropped it. It's going up to a triple. Notice the energy's going up. I can give it even more energy.
everybody. So it's, you know, what's, what's a wave in our universe? Well, sound. So, how big is that sound? I'm not saying how loud or how dim. That's that's we know from decibels. That's how loud a sound is, how soft a sound is. How large is the sound? We don't know. Why don't we know how large the sound is? Because we don't see it. How do you know a mouse is really small? You can see it. How do you know an elephant is really large? You can see it. Use your eyes, but you can't see the sound. Here in our show, we're going to I'm going to do that. Well, you know that already. I'm going to use fire. <laughs> smaller, not too much, but much smaller out of iron there. And now I'm going to turn our lights down. Just like that. And now I'm going to actually put the sound back inside. So when we do that, we will see. Should I do it? Yeah. yeah. 
Go ahead and give it some energy. It's higher. Why is it higher? It now has two notes instead of one. Two notes means a smaller wave means a higher frequency, which is exactly what we see up there in that diagram. Now I can also do this and use this. Notice the sound goes higher. That's why speakers are shaped in this fashion. It's in a very efficient way to adding sound energy to the air. That's why speakers look just like a top of that. Okay? There you go. Okay. Oh, uh, yes, we're up to the. Uh, is it sound waves? Oh, oh, yes, we are. Oh, you've got mine already. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Students usually like it when the professors would still here They can see how we design these demonstrations. So uh, the sound waves depend on the density of the air. If you change the density of the air, the frequency of the wavelength of the waves will change. And then you have a good way of saying about how it interacts with the voice box. Yeah, basically as, those, as that gas moves through your voice box, you, what happens is that you get a vibration, and because of the different densities, you can have it be a higher sound or a lower sound. And we know about helium. Has anyone ever created helium and actually talk? Right, that's fun, right? Does your voice go higher? Yeah. It's because helium is what? Less dense than air. Right? So you have a little bit. I got it. I can't wait much longer. <laughs> I can't inhale the helium and then get air. Yeah. Me the and I think most of you have probably tried that, but here we have a gas that actually is denser. That's right. The helium is it actually wants to leave your lungs, it wants to escape. This stuff doesn't. It wants to stay down there. So it sounds like this for a little bit. I can kind of push it out until it's finally all gone and I'm not going to fake and fall over. <laughs> Sound with different gases. Okay, now we're trying to do density. You know when I'm doing it, either I'm going to look silly or I'm in danger. Well, uh, these guys float. That means they're they are less dense than air. And this is your usual helium balloon, right, guys? That's right. Okay, all right. I keep wondering if they'll slip one in and not make it isn't right. So this it should pop. Don't let it disturb you. Okay. Now this one. This one floats even better. These guys get bigger every time. <laughs> what do you keep getting bigger balloons? Uh, okay, but I guess what's in this one? It floats better. Hydrogen. And what does hydrogen do when you light it? It explodes. It burns. Uh, because it burns, it oxidizes. Combines with the oxygen in the air and forms H2O or water. Remember the Hindenburg? Okay. There's another good reason I'm going to see the front drop. Okay, I used to do this holding it at an arm's length. I can still do that, right? I'm ready to retire. <laughs> uh, this will be a boom and a pop. Nice.
Um, uh, so I, 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 know the, I know the limits. And also, the university has declared me today, also has declared me totally expendable. <laughs> okay, these guys are now so brittle that they soft little flowers break like glass. So properties change a lot when you pull them down. Objects, and here I have a collection of objects. Can you guys recognize what this stuff is? Broccoli! I used to take more joy in that, but my wife puts it with garlic now, it's delicious. Okay, this is a hot dog. Why is it hot dog? Okay, I'll stand a little further back. This is a hot dog. This illustrates why it's so dangerous to handle liquid nitrogen. This is just me, like me. Okay, okay it gets very close. And now this, can you recognize what this guy is? A banana! Okay. 
Come on now. Raise your hands. Anybody on this side over there? 
What do you see when you look at this white light right here? Rainbow. In physics, in physics, we dissect light. We don't dissect animals. We dissect light. Animals are much more messy. But we like to dissect light. And what you can do with those glasses, you can actually split that white light there in all its component parts. What colors on one side of the rainbow? Red. What colors on the other side of the rainbow? Purple. And you know there's a whole lot more coming from this light bulb than we can't see. We have infrared coming from this light bulb. We have ultraviolet coming from this light bulb. You can't see it though. It actually doesn't get, come to it. Gets, it's not, uh, our eyes actually can't see that. But it's there too. Alright? And here's what I can actually do with this bulb. I can go ahead and turn it down. And when I turn this bulb down, we can see the diffraction gradient pattern right up on here. I turn this bulb down, what well, colors are slowly disappearing from our diffraction? Yeah, that's the more energetic part of that light. And what's really interesting about this, this is fantastic physics. What's really interesting, we know from the rainbow we see, using those glasses, exactly the temperature of the filament of this bowl. We know from that rainbow that this is now in a thousand degree filament. We know that. We tell temperature with rainbows all the time in physics and astrophysics. We can look at any, any star in our whole universe. We know exactly the temperature of the star using this, this system. It's amazing physics. I can turn this back up. That's now about 3,000 degrees. Hey, and that's that changes in your glasses. Again, the rainbow has changed, the temperature has changed. That's the connection. Now I turn this one on up top of them. What do you see up top of them? Double rainbow. What's the top rainbow missing? Yellow. There's a black line where the yellow should be. I don't say it, well, maybe fact should say it. They see human beings don't like yellow light mixed with their light. So they cook the interior of this bowl with a material that absorbs the yellow. It doesn't reach you. They're stealing your light. At the same time, this is exactly what all astronomers and astrophysicists do. They can look at any starlight in our whole universe. If there's black lines like that in the starlight, they know exactly what's in between us and that star. That's exactly what we have going on. Okay? Now I'll turn that one off. And this one off. And now turn this one on. What do we see there? A rainbow. Yeah, those bright lights that we have in our pattern right there. Mark, you have your laser to put this out. There's a central one to be seen as well as you can. The people in the room can see it. Okay, there's a real sharp one right here. You see that? These other are reflections, but this sharp red one right here is coming from the gas inside here, and that is hydrogen. This is the most famous line in the universe. If you look in the Orion constellation, there's a red dagger that has a glowing nebula, a glowing hydrogen. And so when you see this red bomber line, they call it, you know you've got hydrogen. 80% of the universe is hydrogen. We have another source of gas here, too. We're going to turn that one off. Let's see if you see a difference between that last one and this one. Uh, here's the important thing to look at right here. You see that yellow? What else is yellow? Orange. The sun, that's right. And, uh, this, this was discovered. This was discovered in the atmosphere of the sun as an eclipse. They didn't know about helium on the surface of the Earth before that, so they named it after the sun, Helos. And so that's why uh, that's in the atmosphere of the sun, and that's helium. Turn that one on. Turn this one on now. You see the very specific lines coming from this? Yeah, you can see that. Here we go. Do we, anybody know what this element is inside here? Right from those lines. Mercury. If I turn on the CFL bulb, you can actually see that those lines match up with the CFL bulb because the CFL bulb has mercury inside it. That's why they're dangerous when they break. You don't really want to breathe, you know, mercury vapors at all. Especially hot mercury vapors really bad for you. So when these breaks, they come too near them. Exactly, that's exactly what's going on inside this bulb, going inside a mercury source. And then we have our last one right here. And that's always a pretty one. This is neon. Everybody always likes the neon. There's a lot of it going on. 
Do you know that middle color is very different than all those colors you see? Those colors combined what we have in our DNA. Now, please, be a scientist with those glasses. Use those glasses all around your house. Investigate the lights in your house. Use those glasses on all the great holiday lights we're going to have up over the next month or so. Use those glasses on a full moon. That's my very favorite thing to do. The continual spectrum is gorgeous. Use those glasses, except don't look at the sun with those glasses. You look at the sun with those glasses, that's a really dangerous thing to do, so don't do that. So instead, let's show you how much fun you can have with them. What do you see when you look at that right there? You see color mixing in action. As these colors shift on the LED lights, you're actually seeing what those colors are made from. So you can be a real scientist. Right now, I'm glad we're able to get those people.
uh, takes energy, uh, makes electricity. If you try and change a magnetic field, the, elect the electricity flows to try and compensate for the change. So changing magnetic fields create currents. And when I roll this down the inclined plane, it rolls down very slowly. Because it hits a part down here where there's no magnetic field, it changes the magnetic field and electricity flows in a circle. And when you set electricity into motion, it takes some of the energy away from something else, and it takes the energy out of the motion of the object. And also, you notice, it doesn't fall off. That's because the changing magnetic field when it gets to the closest to the edge is changing out here in free space, but it's changing in the metal over here, so currents occur over here. It's like paddling a canoe. It gets steered back because it's only paddling on this side. Here, I'll just we'll let it go down under that. Where you're looking down at two right there. Okay, the second one, I really like this one. This one was actually a present to me. Uh, from Tim Cook, who is a, a very outstanding physicist, but he worked at Fermilab, and this large copper chunk of copper with a hole in the middle is just a piece of copper wire. It carried so much electricity, they had to circulate water on the inside to keep it from melting. Okay, they couldn't cool it from the outside because it would melt down. But it makes a wonderful example because I could drop a magnet through it, and when it hits a certain level, it will make current flow at that level, so you can see that it floats down. I'll do it one more time. Can you focus now? You have to be patient. Usually it's a little higher up. It looks just like an astronaut floating down when it doesn't do. I'll let you focus in the morning. So. Okay, maybe it's loose. Okay, but you can see it. I mean, you can just watch me and I drop all there. Now it's an excellent focus. It almost seems like it's magic. The Faraday effect is a really neat effect and you can sure take your time and don't have to get ready until too far ahead of time. I don't like to drop the idiom. Oh, oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Now we have a couple other demonstrations that illustrate the same thing. Here's an inclined plane. If I roll an object down the inclined plane, it goes faster and faster. And here I have a solid piece of aluminum, and it has to pass through a magnet. So when it hits the magnets, he's changing magnetic fields and says, aha, electricity flows in a circle. Okay, so it stops moving as fast. Okay. So as long as it's going in or coming out, it sees changing magnetic fields and electricity flows in a circle. Now I have to prove to you that it's really flowing in a circle. Here I have another piece of aluminum that's cut from one side and then from the other side, so that no electricity can flow in a circle. Not much of it is missing, but there's no circular currents. And it goes as through as if it isn't there. So that proves it's really flowing in a circle. And uh, this one right here has lots of material missing in the center, but it still has a contiguous path around the outside for electricity to flow, and so it also shows the effect. Okay. Now, the next one, has to do with the fact that if you cool the metal down, it conducts electricity better, better, and this effect gets much larger. And so here I have a liquid nitrogen cool piece of aluminum, and you get the effect on steroids. Watch, it's going to speed up now. Boom. Okay, did you see it speed up? No? Okay, let me do it one more time. It goes down. Okay, come on. When it hits, it slows down, and in the middle it speeds up. Okay? That's because it's symmetrical on both sides, and the magnetic field isn't changing. Okay? Okay. The next one... Uh, We're going to do that again. Press again. Okay. Yeah, here we have a lot of wire. What I'm going to do, I'm going to charge up these two large capacitors. Oh. No, you said go. This one makes a very loud noise. Loud noise. 
And I'm not sure when it's exactly going to go off. If we're charging up these capacitors, we're going to release all the energy through that coil at once. Inside that coil is this. It's just a soda can. When we do that, we're going to have that same eddy current effect inside that soda can. Let's see if we can see what this looks like. Come on, Dylan. I know you want to do it. Come on. Sometimes it doesn't. It crushed the can just like that from that same Faraday effect. But what's really interesting about this, this is really hot. All that current actually made this can very, 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 very warm. It's now gone, and if I offset it a little bit, just like that, let's see what we can do here. So I press it again. We might actually get something else going on. And uh, they actually had a plan for NASA. They were actually uh, planning at one point to pull the material off the moon and shoot it around the orbit of the Earth. Because we want to build things around the Earth, right? But it takes a lot of energy and money to pull things out. That's a magnetic field. So what they decided to do was go to the moon and shoot ingots of material at the Earth around the orbit and said, oh, that's what we'll build our space stations out of. And then they thought about it, and they thought, this is way too easy to be a weapon. So they decided not to do it. <laughs> Which is a good thing. So this is the this one? Yeah. OK. This is the same thing now, except it has, instead of having something run into a magnetic field, it's just a magnetic field. This is an electromagnetic field. If I send electricity going in this direction, the magnetic field points up. If I send the current in this direction, it points down. If I send alternating current going both ways, it flips up, down, up, down, so the magnetic field is constantly changing. So that should induce currents in this, and this will become a magnet. And when you have two magnets, you know they either attract or repel. And I wouldn't be doing this demonstration if they attracted. It's called the ring pump. And then what I'd usually do is I would ask the child to come off. Where did he go? Where is he? I didn't hear oh, out of here. I would, I would put, say, okay, put this on here for a long time. I turn it on before child would come off and go like this. So I picked it up, but I said, no, no, I turned it off in the meantime. I just put it on like this. But I don't do that. <laughs> Uh, because this one has a cut out of it, so nothing can fall in a circle, and so it doesn't jump. But then, of course, the kids don't trust me at all, and I have to prove that I'm really turning it on by making the one jump and the other one doesn't jump because electricity can't fall in a circle. The next step is, of course, I have to prove that electricity is going in a circle. So what I do, I just put a light bulb across there. So here's the light bulb across there. Okay, so the transformer, changing magnetic field, induces currents, sends it through a light bulb, so I turn it on, and there's no connection except through the magnetic field. And you can light a light bulb. Now there's one, there's one last thing that we can do with this. This is cool liquid nitrogen temperature. There was a version of this down in Princeton where they do it with a cold liquid nitrogen and they would have a guy up in the ceiling that was uh, waiting to grab it. They'd come up and he'd grab it and wouldn't come back. Okay, so let's do the impulse. <laughs> it's like putting your fingers on a mailbox in Minnesota in the middle of the winter. Now we have our last group of demonstrations to do and for this I need two volunteers, two volunteers. Once again, nobody ever wants to volunteer. You, come on down. You, come on down. What's your name, young lady? This is Aria. Say hi to Aria, please. Lorelei, Lorelei and Aria are going to help us with this demonstration. Do you two know what you, have, what you volunteered for? Let me show you what you volunteered for. You volunteered for the Veta Nails. <laughs> Close to those nails, that's actually Mark's job right there. So here's what we're going to do. You can just stand over here right now. We'll tell you exactly what to do in a couple of seconds, okay? Remember, 
we have right here a bed of nails. Uh, Michelle's going to grab one side, I'm going to grab the other. We're going to move that bed of nails right down here to the floor. These are sharp, sharp nails. I'll improve it a little bit. Mark here is now going to lie down on our bed of nails. <laughs> ready, Mark? Yeah, <laughs> every year, but he really gets up slower every year, too. Now we have a second bit of nails, we're going to take him and put nails down oh. on Mark's body. Oh. to go through human skin. Hey, I'm a scientist. I did the experiment. It's a bad <laughs> So, let's think about it that way. Here we have a whole lot of nails, and here we have Mark. Will this balloon bust out of those nails? No. No. What do we do to find out? If I press, they don't bust. Right? That, that balloon, which is a very thin skin, won't break on those nails. And they are sharp. Here's half as many, doubling the force. Will it break this time? Yeah. 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 Who said maybe? Yeah. You don't put maybe on tests. Will it break this time? Song. Right? That physics show. And that's what we like to do here. We're so glad you joined us today. I'm going to put this right here on Mark's neck. Looks just like a guillotine, right? <laughs> now i got a whole other object right here. What's this? <laughs> this is a cinder block. And it's going to go right here on Mark's rock hard axe. Then we have a sledgehammer. and me with a sledgehammer. Does Mark live? Yeah. What do we do to find out? By the way, Mark was my professor when I was here as an undergrad and he gave me a lousy grade. <laughs> Too late. Three, two, one. Break the break. And Mark is perfectly fine. He's just going to get up really slow. Way to go, Mark. Okay. All right. All 
all of these demonstrations you've seen so far were finely tuned and uh, had large degrees of tolerance. This last one that we do here is an uptown circus trick. And so nobody, I want to be the last person on earth doing this. I saw my um, freshman college chemistry professor do it in 1965. Uh, at any rate, uh, nobody else should try this. Uh, the only reason you get away with it is because liquid nitrogen, when it hits the surface, it's so many degrees above its boiling temperature, forms a protective layer of, of, uh, of gas, of the nurse effect. But what I'm going to do here, I'm going to be the last person doing it. And you've got to be quick. 